Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. Hopefully, the weather was a little bit more enjoyable coming to church this morning than it was last week. Just wet, not as cold, but be in prayer that the weather is supposed to be dropping, so hopefully the roads aren't super icy as we're trying to make our way home this afternoon. But it is good to be in God's house. So let's start with a word of prayer this morning. Father in heaven, as we come before you today, Lord, more than anything right now, we ask for your hand upon our service. Lord, we ask you to bless him, Lord, that we might praise and worship your wonderful and majestic name. Father, that our, our fellowship together, Lord, I thank you for the fellowship you provide us, not just with you, but Lord, with each other as brothers and sisters. Father, I... I pray that we would be an encouragement to one another today. And Lord, as your word is preached, Father, I pray that we would have open hearts to hear the words. And Father, a desire to take them in. Father, allow you to, Lord, direct or even point out in our lives areas in which we need to turn to you more. Or Father, areas that we may need to work on specifically. Lord, for the purpose that we might bring glory and honor to you. So, Lord, we ask you to bless these services. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we get started this morning. Let's go ahead and say our memory verse for the month of January. All together. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Would you stay with me now as we worship our great God? Wonderful grace of Jesus.
all things in. Look at our events for the week. It seems like we're uh, picking back up in uh, activity, that's for sure. Um, tonight we do have a one on youth group, but be uh, looking it's because of the weather. We'll see how things go. Hopefully it doesn't uh, you know, flash freeze and leave some slip roads. Um, also this week, Wednesday, a prayer meeting. Uh, Thursday is a very busy day for the, the building group is meeting at noon, and then men's and ladies' Bible studies are starting as well uh, at 6 o'clock that evening. Um, there are books uh, available for that. Um, are there signs up on the back table? The ladies' Bible studies, but I don't know the men's So the men's uh, sign up is back there. Um, in a couple of weeks, we have our annual church business meeting, um, so make sure you guys get signed up. Um, on the back table as well to um, stay afterwards for our uh, catered Lee's uh, Famous Recipe Chicken uh, and all the other goodies that come with that. Um, on our prayer list, I have a couple of things um, update-wise. Um, Bria's sister, Laura Ankenbrook, is going to be going in for surgery on Tuesday. She's having some brain surgery, um, and there's... The, the goal of this is try to help locate where some seizure activity is coming from to see if they can um, relieve some of that. Um, so she's going to be going on Tuesday for that surgery, and she's got to stay in the hospital the following 10 days to be on monitor. Um, uh, that's going to be difficult. They have a couple of little kids uh, that she's going to be away from for several days, and um, she's not going to be able to do a lot of things on her own because of the, the way monitoring is going. So I uh, just pray that uh, you know she would have um, some answers that they would be able to figure out um, what to do for her. Um, also pray for Justice. Uh, he fell on his way out this morning. Um, he's getting checked out, so just uh, pray that he wouldn't have any injuries, uh, especially with his back issues, and that uh, he would have a quick recovery. Um, other prayer concerns, I don't have any updates. Does anyone have anything else? Uh, thank you also for uh, prayers for Nicole. She's uh, recovering quite well. Um, she had her post op this week um, on Friday, and she's now in a walking boot. Um, and actually, her pain went up getting in a walking boot after getting out of her soft cast. So she's uh, kind of adjusting from that as well. So she's got another week off before she heads back to school. So just keep praying for her. Uh, and thank you for um, the prayers and for some of you guys providing some things, even though it was not necessary. But again, um, thank you. Um, anything else? If you want to get your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 7, I actually do have a couple of things I wanted to add. Uh, two other prayer requests. Um, the Weirigs um, have reached out to me uh, this morning and said just to keep them in prayer. They've been battling a lot of health issues for the last several months, and um, especially Brett's wife Jill and their son Ori have been really sick this week, so continue to keep them in prayer. And then also um, Clay Parrish has been with us a few times, and He's been battling some severe health issues, so on top of all the other colds and whatnot that we have going around, just continue to be praying for one another, because um, thankfully, despite whatever sicknesses or illnesses we face, we know the great physician, amen? amen. That, that's, that's God, he's the great physician. We know the great physician, amen? amen. Okay. Um, I did have a couple thank yous. Um, I did want to say thank you to all the ladies who were out yesterday. It seemed like they all had a good time with the baby shower. And then I want to say thank you to uh, Bill and Cindy for hosting a bunch of crazy kids and a crazy old man who went with them as we decided to jump on tunes and sleds and go down their hill. And it got warmer as the day went on, so that made it even nicer. And when we planned that activity about three weeks ago, we were kind of looking at each other, well, Hopefully there'll be snow that we can go tubing on, and we had a backup plan ready, but the Lord provided the snow this week, which I said, don't tell some of the ladies in this church that I was praying for snow, because they'll get mad at me, but God's good, and I do appreciate those, and for all who were able to come yesterday. Go ahead and stand with me now. Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Starting in verse 1, the Bible says, When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, and a, a centurion slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and to save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, 
He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go, and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in, live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I sent my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than you. <laughs> when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation? What are they like? They're like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, and they say, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not leave. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a bloodless man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her children. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. And when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it. He replied, Say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, 
Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's continue singing this morning. Hear the call of the king.
find our places, we'll say, we will hold me fast.
tied in your word here this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul was writing this letter, as he gets into these two verses, he identified specific things that we should pray for. Now, I don't know about you, but when I can, I like to be specific when I pray and ask God for things, whether it's things in my life or especially when I'm asking for things on behalf of others. I understand there is a time and a place for unspoken prayer requests. You know, some people I've talked to say, well, that, we, we should just say what it is. Well, sometimes we can't divulge certain information, but we know we need prayer. And if anybody in the world, we ought to be able to come to our family and say, hey, will you pray with me? over this, or I'm dealing with something right now, and I can't go into details, but would you pray for me? God knows the situation, right? There's nothing that is unknown to Him. Therefore, when someone asks us to pray without giving us the details, we can go to God and say, Lord, I don't know what the situation is, but I know you do, and Lord, will you answer according to your will? Will you provide grace and, and comfort and wisdom along the way through whatever the situation may be? We can gladly do that. We ought to desire to lift one another up in prayer. Today, as Paul starts into this list, the first thing he says that he's praying for is a worthy walk. A worthy walk. Let me give you the, verse, the first part of the verse 10. Then. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. Now, that first word, walk, it comes from the Greek word parapetel, and it, it literally means to tread all around. And that, we could even see that as the physical ability to walk. But when it's used figuratively, it conveys the idea of how we conduct our lives, how we walk in the faith, so to speak. And Paul was asking God to give them both a desire and an ability to conduct their lives according to his standards. We need God's power in order to walk according to his will. And Paul then takes it a step further by telling them, I'm not just praying that you have the ability and the desire to walk, but that you walk worthy, that you actually do it. See, the curse of sin, when coupled with the saving power of God's grace, produces in us a humble unworthiness. It, it's a realization of God's grace that drives us to serve Him so that we might please Him. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we realize how much He loves us and we want to give Him back everything we possibly can. We're so enamored and grateful for Him. Just like the pursuit of holiness, which will not be fully achieved this side of heaven, we are to be daily pressing toward a life that is worthy of the Lord. I've often said that the most precious gift that we're going to receive in heaven one day, and it, it, I know we can make the argument that it's not as precious as the crown of salvation, but I clarified it with the state. Those of us who are in heaven, we can't get to heaven without the crown of salvation. But the most precious reward that we could ever receive from the Father is not a crown of righteousness, it's not a crown of this or that, it's I'm done. My good and faithful servant. Knowing that we have pleased Him with how we lived our lives for Him. I think that will produce the greatest joy in all of heaven for us. Knowing we've pleased the Father. Knowing we've walked worthy. But that phrase is kind of intimidating. Because in the recognition of what sin has done to us, I know that I am unworthy. And yet, by His grace, walk worthy. He can empower and enable me to be worthy of him. And that, and it's an incredible thought. I believe that pressing on, even though it is a daily pursuit and it seems like I, I, we never fully achieve that worthiness, no matter how hard we strive and how dependent we are upon the Lord, it, it just, there's a part of us that says, I'm still not good enough, God. I'm, I'm amazed that you can take me and use me despite who I am, but I still don't feel worthy of you. But yet, we're to press on. We're to pursue it. 
And I think that's exactly what Paul had in mind when he was talking to the Philippians. I press on. I drain every ounce of energy in my body moving forward so that I might serve you, so that I might be found worthy of you. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are to press on, desiring to be worthy of him. That can only be accomplished by the finished work of Christ on the cross and the daily enabling and empowering of the Holy Spirit. But it requires obedience on our part. What greater thing could we ask God to enable us and others to do than to be worthy of it? And we, we don't do it to, strive, to try to somehow match God's goodness. We desire to please Him. Hopefully, we love Him with our whole heart. You know, to quote Paul in his letter to the Galatians, I am crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live in Christ, or it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He lives in me. He loves me. He gave himself for me. How can I ever stop striving to be worthy of him? As our memory verse this month even says, consider how great things he has done for you. No. This worthy walk contains several features that are highlighted in the New Testament. We're to walk in humility. Take your Bibles and go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 3, and I'll warn you now, I'm going to be jumping a little bit through several verses here. Starting in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Ah, I love this verse. Paul saying, therefore I... The prisoner of the Lord. I belong to him. I'm his prisoner. I implore you. I beg with you. I plead with you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness. With patience. Showing tolerance for one another in love. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You want to walk worthy. We need to do, and we need to walk with him in humility. But secondly, we need to walk in purity. Look at what Romans 13, 13 says. Romans 13, 13. Let us behave properly, as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. If, if I truly have a humble heart in how I walk with him, then I recognize that it was sin and the things in this world that I want out of my life. Now I'm not pure, but I am striving for purity in my life. I, I, I opt to not be looking for ways to try to justify, well, I, 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 you know, I, it's, it's okay to do some of these things. No, Lord, I don't want to have or even be the, the scent or the stain of sin anywhere near my life. I want to be purified from it, purge it out of my life, Lord. Third thing that he goes to is contentedness. See, in pursuing, and this is the argument I would give to those who say, man, it, you know, I get that I don't want to have to die and go to hell one day, but living that Christian life, that's just, that's a lot to ask for because all the things I'm going to have to give up. You don't understand what this life is all about. Because as we walk in Him, He provides a contentment that is unparalleled. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians, yeah, Corinthians 7, 17, only as the Lord has assigned to each of you, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct all the churches. Lord, I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not worried about what position or what place or what direction you have me to go. I just want to go. And I know that whatever it is you've called me to do, if I'm pleasing you, then I can remain completely content in that. If I'm pleasing you, that's where I can get great joy from. Fourth, we're to walk by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 Probably, 
some people's favorite verses when they're talking about salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him so that we would walk in them, live according to them. It's by faith, the faith that he gave us. Fifth, as you go into verses 17 and through 32 in Ephesians 4 there, we're to be different from the world. Look at what Paul says here. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you didn't learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the seed, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. We're to look like Him. We're, we're not to try to, well, I, I want to try to, you know, be appealing to the world so that they would see that there's great joy in Christ and I can win them over. No! What will draw people to Christ is when they realize that there is something different, but not because of us, but because of Him through us. He is amazing, is he not? Not my job to make you see what I see. I want you to see him. And in order to truly do that, we've got to be different from the world. As he goes on, what are, what are some other things that are identifying a worthy walk? How about love? I'm going to be kind to you. The next few are right here in Ephesians. Ephesians 5 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and offering him a sacrifice to God for a fragrant aroma. Love for God and love for the saints love for the lost is something that ought to characterize, or characterize our life. Love. How about walking in the light? Verse 10 of Ephesians 5 there. Trying to, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You back up actually to verses 8 through 10. For you were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And as we're doing that, verse 10 gives us the response that it's easy to you. As you go on in verse 15, therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Well, I tell you what. And, and this does not demonstrate my wisdom because it was only supplied by the Lord. But the one thing that when anybody ever asks me, what can I pray for you? Pray that God gives me wisdom. That is the most 
edifying thing that you could ever pray for someone. God, give them your wisdom. So that they will walk in obedience to your word. And in doing so, they'll actually be a help and be wise and be able to share that wisdom with others. Wisdom is such a wonderful thing to ask God for and to pray for on behalf of others. But then go to 3 John. Right there before you get to Revelation. 3 John verses 3 and 4. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is, how you are walking in truth. I had no greater joy than this to hear my children walking in the truth. We could probably come up with other things to add to this list, but these are the things. You want to say, Lord, I want to have that worthy walk. Do these things characterize our life? They ought to. These are the goals that if you say, you know what? Uh, not doing so good at all of those things. I, though, maybe the Lord's given me some grace and strength and I've been doing good in some of those areas, but some of them, if i got to be honest, I, I need some work on. Well, there you go. Let them be goals. Pursue after them. Why? Because you want to be found worthy. You want to bring glory and honor to him with how you live your life. Second thing that Paul prayed for was a fruitful life. As you continue there in verse 10, he says, bearing fruit in every good work. See, being fruitful results from knowledge. The Holy Spirit takes the wonderful knowledge coupled with our obedience and he manifests it into righteousness in our lives. It's the mark of the redeemed. Jesus said in John 15, 8, that the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit, thus proving to be his disciples. Now, how rewarding would that be to hear Jesus say of you, that's my disciple. Now, some of us would be like, you know, I wish God would talk about me the way you talked about Job. Just don't make me go through all the trials and the suffering that Job had to go through. But how rewarding would that be to know that when Jesus looks at us, He's going to double see. You see, that's my child. That's my disciple. And I'm so happy. And I'm so thankful for what they're doing and how they're seeking to live for me with their life. I want to be fruitful. You know, I'm not trying to sound like Oprah here, but shouldn't we have the other two attitude towards others? God, give them a fruitful life and give them a fruitful life and give them a fruitful life. Shouldn't we be praying that for one another? If we desire it for our own life, we should be desiring it for one another. Fruitfulness. What was it Jesus said? You shall know them by their fruits. See, the Bible defines fruit in many ways. And here Paul's speaking of bearing fruit in every good work. So what is it that produces fruit in our life? Well, the first thing is union with Christ. We're to abide in Him. Go with me to John chapter 15. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Here John says, well, he, Jesus is speaking here, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's not just being saved. That's walking with him. That's that wonderful, abiding union with Christ. But secondly, what produces fruit in our life? It's wisdom. Wisdom. Go to James 3.17. James here says, but the wisdom from above, coming from God, that is, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed 
whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. We need God's wisdom. A lack of fruit is directly related to a lack of spiritual wisdom. But then lastly, you take that union and abiding with Christ, coupled with the wisdom that we ask Him for that comes from His Word, and it requires then lastly, diligent obedience. Flip over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, going to verses 5 through 8, Peter says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful, in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to walk worthy. I want to be fruitful. I want to know that God used me to accomplish some great things according to His will. And I also want to pray those things for each and every one of you. We ought to be lifting each other up and asking God, will you help? This one, and 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 call everyone out by name. Say, Lord, help them to be walk worthy. Help them to be fruitful. The third thing that Paul draws attention to is a growing knowledge or a continual growth. The last part of verse 10 there says, increasing in the knowledge of God. Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to do was study something once and then we would know it perfectly forever afterwards? That'd be so nice. But the fact remains that we are to continually, day by day, be studying God's Word, seeking to gain more and more knowledge of Him. And I'm going to tell you this. It's something my grandpa used to say all the time. He said the most incredible thing about this book is it doesn't matter if you've read a verse a thousand times, you can still gain more and more from it. No other book in the world is like this. Because this is like no other book. This is the very Word of God. You know, to quote a Sunday school song that many, I'm sure, would know, we're to read our Bibles and pray every day so that we, oh, come on, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Guess what? That message is just as important for us, whether we're 8 years old or 80 years old, amen? We're to be in God's Word, seeking to be growing every day. See, when you get saved, there should have been this overwhelming desire to know the Lord, more and more, as, as well as the desire to grow. And Peter describes new believers and babes in, as babes in Christ who desire the sincere milk of the world. word. However, that desire for the milk should begin to hunger more and more. I, I don't really remember much baby food that I eat, but I guarantee you one thing, I wouldn't eat it right now out of pure desire. I'd rather have steak or lobster or something like that, something I can chew on. Our spiritual taste buds should be no different in wanting more and more. We have to desire the steak and potatoes, so to speak, of God's Word. Now, the difference between physical food and spiritual one here is that I don't care about baby food anymore. But I still appreciate some of the beginning principles I learned about Him and His Word. What makes me appreciate them all the more even now is that even though I desire the heart of your truth, the Holy Spirit taking those basic principles and has begun to elaborate on them and show me more and more about them. And they've become more and more precious to me. If I were to invite you over to dinner and then serve you a jar of baby food, I'd imagine you'd probably be a little disappointed. Now, I say most just because after working with teenagers, I always get one stubborn one that says, oh, I, I like baby carrot food. Shut up, no, you don't. <laughs> but how can someone who is truly saved ever be satisfied with just John 3.16 or the basic components of salvation. And don't get me wrong, those are truly wonderful, but there's so much more to them than what we initially comprehend. And we should not want or desire to become stale or stagnant in our spiritual life. We hopefully want to continue growing and becoming more and more like Christ. But that's not possible without a pursuit of the knowledge that's contained within the Word. Spiritual growth comes from a continual pursuit of the knowledge of God. 
That phrase, in the knowledge, means that our increasing takes place in the knowledge of God. We find the knowledge of God in His Word. So I want to give you some marks that indicate spiritual growth in your life. And we ought to consider these like pencil markings on the doorway of our height as we grow. Here's what I am now, and when I look back, hopefully I will see where I have grown and where I need to keep growing. By the way, we're never going to stop growing this side of heaven. So the first mark, go with me to Psalm 119.97. I told you, you were going to get your finger exercise and turn the pages this morning, hopefully. Psalm 119, go to verse 97. The first mark of spiritual growth is a continually deeper love for God's Word. Verse 97 says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Lord, I love your law. I want to know it more and more so that I can know you more and more. To love God is to love His Word because He is the Word. The second mark is found in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. By this, we know that we've come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And by this, we know that we are in him. Second mark, it would do no good to acquire and acquire all the knowledge about God and then do nothing with it. The second mark of true spiritual growth is a more complete obedience. Over and over in John's letters, he iterates and reiterates that the proof of our love for the Lord is found in our obedience to Him. You can go back to the first point and say that you desire to know God's Word better, but obedience calls you out and challenges us to put our money where our mouth is. It's where the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Obedience contains both an external and an internal response. As we respond, it becomes obvious to those around us. Then the third one, it's found in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Just like Paul had been doing for the Colossians, he tried to teach us to others. Give thanks to God for the brethren who have received the gospel truth and have had their faith growing exponentially. But then verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you. As it's only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged in the love of of each one of you towards one another grows even greater. The third mark of spiritual growth is an enlarged faith. Is your faith any bigger than it was when you first got saved? I'll tell you this. The more you learn about him, coupled with the test that he brings into your life, you will find your faith and trust in him grows. Sometimes it's happening even beyond our notice. But we can truly look back and say, God, I had no idea what you were doing. I'm so thankful for what you've done. I look forward to what you have next for me. Obedience, a deeper love for God's word, and enlarged faith. But the last part is found in Philippians 1 9. Philippians 1 9. And this I pray that your love they abound still more and more in real knowledge of all this world. A greater and a growing love. A greater and deeper love is an absolute part of spiritual growth. Know, know what Paul was saying to the Philippians in that verse. Here's what I'm praying. That your love may grow more and more and more and more, never ceasing to grow. We can never love enough. And as much as that is true in our relationship with one another, May it, even, may it be even more true in our love for the Lord. He's given us all of His love. And in response, we ought to be growing in our love for Him and one another. A deep love and desire for God's Word, a more perfect obedience to His Word, an enlarged faith, and a greater love for both God and one another. If these things are evident in our life today, then that's a mark that we are growing in Him. There's something we need to work on, just like the earth. There's goals. Start doing it. We're to pray for a worthy walk, a fruitful life, continual growth, 
Then as we come into verse 11, Paul adds a dependent strength. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. If you know anything about strength, you surely know that it can be hard work to build up strength. But if there's no effort to keep or maintain it, much less to see it grow, it can disappear rather quickly. Sometimes it's actually harder to regain strength than it is to initially gain it. One of the most difficult parts of rehabilitation is dealing with muscular atrophy. For those of you who've had to go through some difficult rehabilitation, and you know it better than I do, regaining that strength is hard. It's even painful. But when Paul used that word strengthen, the, the structure here indicates that we are to be continually strengthening or being pulled up by his power. But God's not some power booster who shoots us off and then we fly alone. We're to be continually strengthened with all power throughout our Christian life, daily working with the Holy Spirit. See, the measure or source of that power is according to his glorious way. See, that word might is strength in action. The power available to us is the limitless power of God himself. God's power is supplied to us through the Holy Spirit. And as much as we should desire to be growing and feasting upon the meat and potatoes of God's wisdom and his word, we should also desire to become stronger and stronger in our faith. I must point out that that's opposite of what the world wants or teaches us. The world teaches us that we're to become more and more independent. However, God's word teaches us we're to become more and more dependent on him. Remember what Paul said? Power is perfected in weakness. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. The key to being strengthened is to depend on him. But then the final thing that Paul prays for is endurance. But not just any kind of endurance. Joyful. For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. And then he throws in that word, joyously. If you can't tell, I am not a runner. I've never enjoyed running as a kid, and I still don't today. But into my sophomore year in high school, my third year on the basketball team, our coaches had the brilliant idea that we need to have an endurance, uh, our conditioning program. <laughs> you need what? I remember my eighth grade year and my freshman year, I hated tryouts for the basketball team because our assistant coach is the one who led them, and the first two days of tryouts were at the park, and that man, to me in my mind, I love him to death, but when it came to basketball, I couldn't stand him because he reminded me of like some Olympic reject who he never quite made to the Olympics, so he just had to keep running and running again to make everyone else run too. And that's what it felt like he did to us during those trials. But then they're like, no, we're going to do this for two weeks. And you got to go through the conditioning program in order to try out for the basketball team. That's when I looked at my buddy and said, you know, I don't know if I want to play basketball anymore. But I did. I went through that program and even though I hated every minute of the running, got to a point when the basketball season started, we started getting into games where it's the third and fourth quarter and we're still running like the game just started. And we're running laps around guys. And you start to realize, man, endurance, it takes a lot, but the benefits of it are incredible. That's what Paul was asking God to supply the Colossians. See, Paul was asking God to give them endurance in all things. And the word steadfast there comes from a word which means to be patient in circumstances. But then the word patience is talking about being patient with people. But both point to a patient endurance through trials. And whether it's circumstances or people, both can be difficult. But Paul's not asking God to give them a bridge or teeth and just get through a kind of endurance. Because look at what that last word is. It's joyous. Some might argue that this word belongs in the next verse, but I believe it's the connection between the two. The point is, we need an endurance that comes with the right attitude. I don't have to convince anyone that it's a fight to endure in this world because of the curse of sin in our enemies. But just doing what is right outwardly is in vain if we're not doing it for the right reasons. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.
you think about this list, I don't, I would hope there's not a one of us would say, I'm not worried about being worthy of the Lord. Hopefully everyone would say, I would love for God to characterize my walk and my service to him as being worthy. I would love to think that he looks at me and sees a fruitful life because I'm obeying him and much of being accomplished for his glory. I, I want to have that growing knowledge of him. I, I want to have that dependent strength. But I even want that joyful endurance. But here's the two challenges that I have for you this morning. Despite all those lists of things that we can't be working on, here's the question. Are we pursuing them? Are we praying for one another to have those things? What please be with my brother and sister? I'm so thankful for them and the, the blessing that they are to my life. And, or would you have them to walk worthy of me? And, and I don't pray that just because I see problems in their life. I pray because I love them. I want them to enjoy having a worthy walk of the Lord or being fruitful. Or to be ever increasing in their knowledge of Him and His Word. To truly be strong Christians. I want that for my life and for others. What do you pray for? Father in heaven, as we come before you, But I'm so grateful that we can attain these things. Lord, it's not going to happen without you. And Father, as we need to be pursuing these things in our life, God, help us to come to you and ask these things for others. Lord, I pray in this coming year Lord, we would see great growth in this church. And Father, while we desire, for, Lord, more than anything, to be able to lead and point others to you and see them come to know you, Lord, we ask for that, but Lord, the growth that I'm asking for you this morning is not just numbers, Lord, but deeper and stronger relationships with you. And God, I pray that for everyone here. Lord, I ask you now, Father, give us the desire and the ability to walk where you Father, produce in us fruitful lives. I ask you for so these things. We ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me now as we sing? The fact that we can have all of these things that we do to Paul is showing us. Because Jesus loves us. Do you love him?